Hello, we're here with uh, Judge Andrea Robertson, who's running for re-election to King County Superior Court position 47. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Certainly, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I was a practicing attorney in the trial practice for 22 years, and it was last year that I decided it was time to move on to the next chapter of my professional career. I began the process of judicial evaluations, and I received the qualification of exceptionally well qualified, which is the highest possible rating from five different independent bar associations. I also received endorsements by over 70 current and former trial judges anywhere from municipal all through the way through the Supreme Court. I received the endorsements of hundreds of practicing trial attorneys and I was quite thrilled to receive a call from Governor Jay Inslee in December offering me an appointment to the King County Superior Court position 47. It was a position being vacated during a term by a sitting judge, so I am running to retain my seat at this time. I will tell you that this is not an easy time to work in the courts, and I was very gratified by my background and my training in the court system because there are a lot of challenges that come with being a trial judge during a pandemic. In an average day pre-pandemic, this is a general jurisdiction court, so there would be over 30 jury trials going on simultaneously. But the pandemic put the end not only to jury trials, but also typical proceedings. And we've had to find a new way to find ways to access justice. And that's presented not only challenges, but it's also presented some ways in which we rethink how access to our court system works. So there are actually some aspects of dealing with COVID that have led to improvements in access to justice and ways in which we are going to continue using the tools that we're learning at this time. The biggest hurdle we have to get over is a backlog of criminal cases. Over 6,000 cases are in pretrial status in the criminal caseload. That includes over 200 murder trials. So that's our biggest challenge, our biggest concern. But I have been very gratified to enter a very passionate group of, of judges who are looking at ways to access justice and find diversity and inclusion. I'm, I'm looking forward to any questions that you have. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna place the first question into the chat so we can follow along as Laura reads. Go ahead, Laura. What, what is your general judicial philosophy and why? I think that when I decided to become a judge, I spent a lot of time thinking about the judges that I have most appreciated over the years. And there wasn't any particular judge or philosophy that stood out to me. I looked at qualities that a number of different judges embodied in terms of what type of judge I would want to be. First and foremost, I spent 22 years representing individuals, over 1,500 individual clients. So I never want to forget that the people in front of me are sometimes in front of me on the worst day of their life. So remembering the compassion and empathy that's necessary for a judge to make an informed decision, but also remember the human being aspect of it is something that I never want to lose. I also have always appreciated judges who come to the bench very well prepared. Uh, they don't wing it. They're They've read through everything that's ready to go on the case and they're very thoughtful and they listen to the advocates long and hard before making a decision. And then the third thing that I emphasize in my own uh, judicial approach is something that I've always admired about judges who are brave enough to make the right decisions. Even if it's politically unpopular, something that is the right thing to do and it's in accordance with the law is that the decision that the judge needs to make, even if they know that they'll receive some blowback from some group at some point down the road. So bravery, empathy, preparedness, and professionalism, those are all qualities that I seek to embody every day when I'm a judge. Thank you. Um, now we're moving on to the second question and I'm gonna ask Carrie, could you please uh, take that one? What will you do as a judge to eliminate and mitigate bias on the bench? Certainly, well, there's a couple of different facets to that. One is the bias that you see in how cases come before you, the bias of the parties, the bias of how things are presented and considered by a jury or a fact finder besides yourself. And then there's the bias that you see within yourself as a judge. And each one of those presents some challenge. 
Um, every day I look at cases in which I have to seriously consider how the case came before me and what aspects of bias entered into why the case is before me. Right now, my current rotation is primarily dependencies, which are matters that are brought to the court because a child has been removed from their parents. And the Department of Children, Youth and Families is taking the position that there needs to be an intervention and additional services provided for the parents who they believe are incapable of providing a safe place for their children. So right away, you can imagine that there are some aspects of that consideration that might involve some look at cultural differences and biases that might enter into the consideration of how that person is parenting, also how services are provided to them, whether they are in accordance with the Indian Child Welfare Act, if these folks are from Native American descent, all of those enter my consideration each and every day. I also have to check my own bias because I'm a mother and anytime I see someone before me and there's a question as to parenting, I have to look at things not as I would consider as a parent, but I have to consider it through the lens of that person in front of me. And sometimes they're facing challenges, both uh, systemic and poverty driven and addiction and mental health aspects that provide additional challenges in terms of how they're equipped to parent. So I have to check that bias each and every day. There are obviously other concerns for issues regarding bias in a jury, but that is a longer answer that I could probably provide if you wanted to talk about that in a follow-up question. Great, thank you. I'm gonna place a third uh, question into the chat and Alice, if you would please take that one. Absolutely. Um, in the area of hate crimes, what are some of the issues in bal balancing free speech rights against the need to control offensive activity? Certainly. Um, there's actually been some recent changes in terms of making it more inclusive of other aspects of hate speech in malicious, the prosecution of um, malicious actions. Um, and the extension of that is to uh, look at instances in which there is a hate crime committed with anti-Semitic symbolism or writings. It also cross applies to um, other countries in the Middle East. And I think there was a recognition by the legislature that hate crimes can encompass other types of speech and writings and symbols that hadn't typically been considered before. Now, setting all that aside, there's still the aspect of First Amendment protections um, that also has to be considered. But in the criminal realm, there's a very careful consideration as uh, far as whether there is uh, any action driven by any hate-based speech that's against a particular group that a judge has to look at very carefully in each instance. And the change in the legislature actually allows for a stronger consideration of whether that um, hate motivation extends to symbolism and writings um, that we hadn't previously considered. So it gives us a little bit more guidance in that regard. Great, thank you. And I'll place question number four. And I believe Jeff, um, that one is for you. Great, so while serving on the bench, do you believe you have a role in bringing important legal or judicial issues before the public or the legislature? Why or why not? And what should your role be? That's a, a very interesting and kind of multifaceted uh, way to look at it, because in essence, I'm making rulings every day that have profound effects on the people before me, but they also are a comment sometimes on systemic issues that me need to be addressed. So on the smaller level, you look at it on a case by case basis, and my job is not to legislate from the bench, but I certainly have to consider the big picture. And sometimes my rulings uh, reflect a statement that indicates that there is a problem in the system that I don't have the tools to fix or solve. So in that regard, on a case-by-case -case basis, a judge has the important job of not only making a ruling, but recognizing when there is a problem. I'll give you an example of something that's recently been changed for our state Supreme Court. For years, there were sentencings that sometimes uh, took into account the seriousness of a crime, but not necessarily the age of the person who committed it. And we recognize now that children are different and their brain chemistry and their brain development um, hasn't reached the level where you can assess the same kind of mental state and culpability that you would for an adult. So a judge who would make a sentencing decision might say, well, the standard range that I'm forced to make a decision within is this range from here to here. However, I'm bound by that and I can't consider the fact that the person 
who committed this is 19 years old and hasn't fully developed the um, mental capacity to make informed decisions and they have additional challenges that might come from having that, um, that uh, still yet to be completely formed brain. So our Supreme Court actually watched how that panned out in case after case. And on the appellate level, you're gonna see the actual change in the law. And from our Supreme Court, we received guidance in the form of decisions, which indicate that children are different and that a judge has to take that into account. Not only that, a recent decision that the uh, US Supreme Court has declined certiorari allows for resentencings for that particular issue. I'm sorry, these are really good questions and it's hard to answer them in two minutes. <laughs> Great, all right. Uh, now we can go into follow-up questions where you get an additional minute. And uh, Mary Kylie, go ahead. Um, I'm interested if you would follow up about the, um, the jury uh, biases. Sure, absolutely. So. There are a couple of different areas in jury trials that deserve important consideration. And one is uh, pulling a diverse jury pool. And through the years, I think that has been a consistent problem that King County has attempted to tackle. And one of the interesting silver linings from the pandemic is jury selection has been virtual. And when it comes to a civil trial, the rest of the trial is virtual as well. But with the criminal case, there's a virtual jury selection and then the actual trial proceeding once the jury is sworn in is happening in person. What we're finding anecdotally is there is a broader diversity of jurors who are showing up for their jury service because it is virtual. It's more inclusive, it's a little more accessible. This, so that is drawing the jurors in. The second aspect is retaining them. And part of that- seconds. Oh my goodness, there is so much to unpack here. I will go to the third question, which goes to a general rule attacking whether or not the strikes of a juror from the panel when they're being seated for a trial is premised upon a racial bias. And that is something I could talk about at length because there's been some recent changes to the rule and some recent court decisions from our Supreme Court that allow judges to give that an extra consideration. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so um, you've partially answered my question about um, juries, but you had mentioned in your opening um, that COVID required changes to the administration and, and everything, and that some of, some of those things are things that you'd want to keep. And I was curious, I, I'm an administrative law judge for the state by day, and we're seeing the same thing. We had to do stuff like, oh, maybe we'll keep doing that. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious what other things you see as the future of the judicial process sure. after trying it out through COVID. Absolutely. I, after being a, a trial attorney for so many years and seeing so much wasted time in court, I am very grateful to see ways in which judges are in uh, embracing more of the virtual aspect of procedural hearings. Um, I, in, in any given criminal case, I might have a client who would go to court 10 separate times. And each time they had to take the day off of work. They had to arrange for parking downtown. They had to arrange for childcare. And they might be there for a 30 second hearing. So allowing some of these procedural hearings to happen virtually actually allows for less impact on folks who might not be equipped financially to be able to afford it. So that is something we've seen an improvement on. And then I think we've been pleasantly surprised at how jury selection, which was something that I think a lot of attorneys fear virtually, that it's actually allowing kind of a close um, look at the person's facial expressions. I mean, we're all experiencing virtual meetings all the time now, but the jury selection process is a lot more high quality than we expected. So I was actually invited to be part of a committee to speak to the Supreme Court in terms of changing the rule to allow that to happen long term. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Laura. Uh, what is your opinion or position, if any, on and, um, ways we can reform our bail system, specifically cash bail? Sure, absolutely. First and foremost, I think for some judges, they are not taking a good look at the court rule that assesses whether or not someone should have bail set in the first place. So your first line in as a judge who is hearing those release conditions is to determine uh, 
that the person should be released on personal recognizance. It is only unless you find that they're likely to recommit an, a violent offense or that they're a flight risk or both that you are supposed to consider a way in which you restrict their behavior. And that still needs to be the least restrictive means to secure their presence in court and keep them from committing a new offense. So first it's going back to the rule and not falling into the trap that I think some judges do, which is it's a serious offense. It has victims seconds. who have been harmed and therefore you're setting a dollar value on that. That, as we know, across the board is going to impact communities of color to a greater degree. It changes the plea negotiations. It changes the likelihood of them going to trial. If they can't afford to bail out, they can't afford to sit there in time for trial. So it's a complex question, but I think we need to start first with looking at the heart of the court rule and how it's implemented. Thank you. Um, I'll let you talk a little bit about the backlog you spoke about um, and what the plans are there. Sure, absolutely. Well, first it's making sure that everyone is safe. So um, there have been a couple of times where we have started in-person trials and we've had to back off of them. There is still a virtual jury selection process for criminal cases um, and then an in-person aspect. The ways in which we are protecting the public safety is to have things happen in two separate courts. The jury no longer gets into a small room for uh, deliberations and recess in between court proceedings. They're actually in a separate courtroom. So as you might imagine, that still provides uh, some challenge in terms of being able to balance the space, but we're working through that as quickly as we can. Uh, I think there's going to be a reassessment about case um, scheduling in, in terms of which judges are hearing criminal cases because that's where the biggest backlog is. The civil cases we've been able to get on top of to a much greater degree and things like dependencies, terminations, and voluntary commitments by adopting more virtual aspects. But because the right of confrontation would preserve the need for an in-person trial for criminal, it provides unique challenges that we're still trying to get on top of. Great, thank you. Yeah, additional follow-up questions. I will also ask a guest, oh, oh sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, and I may have asked you this exact question last year, but uh, what role can you and other judges play in the funding of the courts and the judicial system and advocating for that? Um, as you know, it's very underfunded, um, you, know, I, you know, and has to rely on you know, filing fees and other user fees, which of course are very regressive. So um, how do you see your role in increasing the funding of the courts? You know, ironically, that's been a recent conversation with myself and the other judges who are assigned to dependencies and terminations is discussing um, if any aspect of the funding that comes down from recent legislation for recovery could be committed to our department, where would we want to see it um, used? Uh, so there's definitely weighing in in that regard. Uh, there are also uh, task forces that look to judges to give comments in terms of where things are lacking. And there are many areas where it's pretty obvious where the funding could be improved. As to the earlier question regarding jury retention, keeping jurors who are able to serve their time, the fact that we pay them $15 a day certainly doesn't help retain folks who may not be able to afford to take that time off of work. So any aspect of seconds. being asked for judicial um, insight in terms of where funding could be improved, that's an easy one to stand up for. So while we're not particularly uh, supposed to lobby. We are sometimes asked for input on a yearly basis in terms of where funding is needed. And there are certainly areas I have no problem speaking up about. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I can ask one more. Uh, so as a judge, uh, what, what do you consider to be your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Boy, I'd say my greatest strength is the fact that I've always worked for people. So I, what I spoke about in the beginning as far as empathy, it's something that I think comes to me each time I'm on the bench because I'm used to being there holding the hand of the person who is on the worst day of their life. So I think that strength um, and the fact that I'm able to see that in each case is 
frankly, the most important aspect of what I bring to the bench. The second is my work ethic. I have no problem putting in the hundreds of hours that are required to sit on the bench and be well prepared and diligent and be able to make informed decisions. Um, that type of workload has never scared me and it never will. Um, and then as far as my approach to trying seconds. to solve the issues in front of me, I like to think that I see things on a big picture level. So I will hear the arguments from each side, but I don't always want to make a decision based on the minutia. If I see that public policy and really the right thing to do involves some type of uh, collaborative decision, I will often ask the parties ways to try to work out the proper uh, resolution of a case without being tied to the legal um, red tape. Great, thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and if you would like to give a one minute wrap up, now would be a good time. Thank you. Um, as you can hopefully tell from speaking with me tonight, I have a lot to say in terms of how our court is going at this time. It is definitely a challenging time, but I'm very lucky to be surrounded by 52 other very passionate benchmates who all have a strong push for access to justice and also ways in which diversity and inclusion and the elimination of systemic inequities and racism can be accomplished in our court system. I have felt very gratified to be on this bench doing this very important work. Um, at this point, I do not have an opponent. Um, my hope is that I will reach filing week and that will remain the situation, but I'm certainly meeting as many groups as I can uh, to introduce myself, to answer questions, um, and hopefully earn your endorsement. If anyone has any further questions or would like to read more about me, judgeandrearobertson.com or retain Andrea Robertson on Facebook are ways in which you can learn more about me. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone ever has if they'd like to email. Great. Thank you so much.